So today's event is one in a series of talks, panels, and events planned over this academic year to commemorate and celebrate the OHC's 40th anniversary, uh, inspired by our theme, Humanities Matters, and it was up there for a while. Um, so we mean our theme in two senses. First, we want to highlight the diverse matters that scholars and, st and students in the humanities and the humanistic social sciences study, research, and teach. Uh, and second, we want to affirm that the humanities matter, that the materials we study, the skills we teach, and the knowledge we create are relevant, valuable, and necessary to our lives, communities, and polities. Like this one, most of the remaining events we've planned will feature UO humanities scholars who will discuss their areas of study and why the knowledge they produce matters. But before I turn to introducing our speaker, I have a couple of announcements as I usually do. First, uh, the OHC encourages and participates in the university's ongoing efforts to support tribal communities and indigenous community members. We recognize the role uh, academia and research institutions have played and continue to play in colonialism, and as part of our recognition of that history and its contemporary manifestations, we offer this land acknowledgement, uh, the university's land acknowledgement. The University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the Coast Reservation in Western Oregon. Today, Kalapuya descendants are primarily citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, and they continue to make important contributions to their communities, to the U of O, to Oregon, and to the world. In following the indigenous protocol of acknowledging the original people of the land we occupy, we also extend our respect to the nine federally recognized indigenous nations of Oregon. The Burns Paiute tribe, the confederated tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Seleucia Indians, the confederated tribes of the Grand Ronde, the confederated tribes of Siletz Indians, the confederated tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the confederated tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquel Indian tribe, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua tribe of Indians, and the Klamath tribes. We express our respect to the many more tribes who have ancestral connections to this territory, including the uh, Chinook Indian Nation and the Fort McDermott, Paiute, and Shoshone tribes, as well as all other displaced indigenous peoples who call this place we call Oregon home. Next, I want to encourage members of our community who appreciate and support the OHC to consider applying to join our Board of Visitors. The Board of Visitors is a volunteer group of citizens who provide a, a vital link between the Oregon Humanities Center and the general public. Board of Visitors members serve as OHC advocates by being ambassadors for the OHC in the community, attending OHC events, contributing financial support, and providing guidance to the director and associate director regarding OHC programs and goals. If you're interested to learn more, uh, please click on the link at the bottom of the OHC's homepage, uh, ohc.uoregon.edu. Uh, next, we'll have time for questions following our lecture. Because we're live streaming the event, I'll bring a microphone to people in the audience uh, who would like to ask questions. To maximize audience opportunities to ask questions, please keep your questions as concise as possible and make sure to ask a question. I also need to offer uh, my uh, uh, characteristic thanks. The OHC has been able to thrive for 40 years largely because of the generosity of our many loyal donors. We're especially gratified by our donors' support this year because their generosity not only allowed us to meet our 40th anniversary goal of uh, $40,000, but to surpass it by over $20,000. So we are tremendously grateful for that support. Uh, and. and I, I should do that for you guys, because you, you're the ones who did it. We couldn't have done all that we uh, do uh, and have been doing for 40 years without that help. Uh, thanks also to our collaborators in UO Libraries and especially in UO Media Services for their incredible technical support. And last but certainly not least, thanks to the OHC's in amazing staff, 
um, Associate Director Gina Turner, Program Coordinator Melissa Gustafson, Communications Coordinator and UO Today producer Peg Fries Gerhardt. And I will give them a hand. So our terrific staff, collaborators, and patrons have made it possible for 40 years for the OHC to organize public humanities events and host world-class scholars like our speaker today, UO Professor Laura Polito. Professor Polito will present this year's Robert D. Clark Lecture in the Humanities. The Clark Lecture was established in 1994 and has been sustained since then through the generosity of the Oregon Community Foundation. We are grateful for the Foundation's steadfast support of the humanities and the OHC. The Clark Lecture aims to promote public discussion on the natural sciences and social and cultural affairs as exemplified by Thomas Condon, geologist, paleontologist, and founding member of the University of Oregon. The lectureship was named in honor of uh, the revered former UO president, Robert D. Clark, who wrote the book, The Odyssey of Thomas Condon. So I'm now delighted to introduce properly our speaker for this afternoon. An educator, author, and activist, Laura Polito is the Collins Chair and Professor of Geography, Indigenous, Ethnic, and Race Studies, and Latinx Studies at the University of Oregon. She is a qualitative social scientist who works at the intersection of geography and critical ethnic studies, especially Chicanics studies. Her areas of ex expertise include critical human geography, comparative and relational ethnic studies, environmental justice, cultural memory, political activism, Chicanx studies, landscape, labor, and radical tourism. Professor Polito is a prolific author and editor. She is the author of Black, Brown, Yellow, and Left, Radical Activism in Los Angeles from 2006, and Environmentalism and Economic Justice, Two Chicano Struggles in the Southwest, 1996, and the co-author of A People's Guide to Los Angeles, 2012. She has co-edited three volumes, Clyde Woods's posthumous book, Development, Drowned and Reborn, The Blues and Bourbon Restoration in Post-Katrina, New Orleans from 2017, Black and Brown in Los Angeles, Beyond Conflict and Cooperation, 2013, and Racial Formation in the 21st Century from 2012. In recognition of her groundbreaking work across her fields of expertise, Professor Polito has received numerous awards and grants, of which I share only the most recent. The American Association of Geographers has honored her with multiple awards and recognition, including Distinguished Scholarship Honors, the Harold Rose Anti-Racism Award, the Globe Book Award for Public Understanding of Geography, and an Enhancing Diversity Award. In addition to these awards from the American Association of Geographers, Professor Polito has won the Cullum Geographical Medal from the American Geographical Society, a Faculty Excellence Award from the University of Oregon, a Guggenheim Fellowship, two National Science Foundation Research Awards for Geography and Spatial Sciences, and she was a co-PI on the largest grant ever awarded to the UO by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for the Pacific Northwest Just Futures uh, Institute for Racial and Climate Justice. Given this distinguished record of accomplishments, there's little doubt that Professor Polito's Clark Lecture will offer an exceptional demonstration of why the matters that scholars working in the humanities and the humanistic social science, sciences study, why what we study matters. Her topic this afternoon is Surplus White Nationalism and GOP Climate Obstruction. Please join me in welcoming Laura Polito. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paul, for that very generous introduction. That was, that was very long. I think it attests to my age. <laughs> um, let's see. All right. So thank you very much to the OHC for inviting me to share my work with you today. Special thanks to Jenna, Peg, Melissa, and Paul for making this happen. I also want to acknowledge some of my um, colleagues who have been my intellectual comrades. The talk that I'm going to give today is like really a U of O talk. I cannot imagine have developing this anywhere else. Um, and special shout out to Kari Norgard, Julius McGee, Joe Lowndes, and all my colleagues in IRIS and in geography. 
Um, I actually, um, when Jabo became the head of geography several years ago, he wanted to do this thing like asking people to come and just like, just like, you know, talk about whatever you're thinking about, your, get, you know, early ideas, half-baked ideas, and I did. And uh, they were really half-baked. I didn't have any data sources and stuff like that. But that's, this is actually this talk th years later <laughs> that I've been working on it and trying to piece together and it's still in no way complete. This is still very much a work in progress. So I'm very eager to hear your, get your input and your thoughts. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. Thank you. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my current thinking on the relationship between climate change and white supremacy. Um, I started this work hoping to document how we got into the current climate crisis. Part of me was curious, how and why do we refuse to stop burning fossil fuels in the face of impending disaster? And part of me was angry, who is to blame? All right. I'm especially angry knowing that we have wasted precious decades that could have made a difference. According to the UN, current climate policies have us on track for a 4.8 temperature increase by 2100. This is despite the fact that we have, there has been scientific consensus since at least 2006. Moreover, we have known how to mitigate the problem, if not actually solve it. And yet, we refuse to engage in meaningful action. Hence, I wish to document, blame, and bear witness to this historic moment. Of course, there are positive things happening, especially around the proliferation of renewable energy. But this does not change the fact that emissions continue to climb. In fact, the U.S. is set to produce more crude oil than ever. Countries that were committed to cutbacks, like Brazil and Canada, are also backsliding. Their logic is that as long as there's market demand, we will meet it. My analysis centers on the Republican Party and its refusal to act on climate over the last 15 years. At first, I assumed that it was just doing the bidding of the fossil fuel industry, what is often called regulatory capture. But as I looked at the data, I realized that there was more going on. In fact, when I juxtaposed the data with larger changes in the racial formation, I began to see some connections. They are not obvious, nor are they causal, but they are real. So today, I'm first going to explain why the GOP's actions are not just a case of regulatory capture. Second, I discuss the importance of white nationalism to help explain the GOP's climate obstruction. And third, I present three different moments of climate obstruction and their connection to white nationalism. The first one is the rise of the Tea Party from 2009 to 2015. Second, the Trump era from June 2015 to January 2020. And lastly, the GOP's war on wokeness, which brings us to the present. Now, many scholars, such as Oreskes, have documented the fossil fuel industry's disinformation campaign, which has contributed to massive levels of denial. More recently, researchers have shifted their attention from denial to focusing on, uh, on focusing, excuse me, on, to refocusing on refusing to act or pursuing very limited forms of action, what Michael Mann calls inactivism. I argue that the GOP is not engaged in inactivism, but rather obstruction. These are deliberate, premeditated efforts that intensify climate warming by blocking climate action and supporting fossil fuels. Drawing on both Norgard and Daggett, we can think of climate inaction along a spectrum. Ignorance, denial, enabling, refusal, and obstruction. Andreas Malm and the Zetkin Collective, drawing on Althusser, argue that the fossil fuel industry's denial machine should be understood as an ideological state apparatus, or an ISA. An ISA is a system of defined institutions, organizations, and the corresponding practices, which, through their day-to-day -day activities, 
uphold some elements of the dominant ideology. The dominant ideology in this case, of course, is the belief that fossil fuels are good. Moreover, they point out that this belief is rooted in a particular mode of accumulation, one based on fossil fuels, what they call fossil capital. Fossil capital is facing an existential crisis, and the state, as part of the fossil fuel ISA, has sought to bolster it. It is important to underscore that both political parties are implicated in the fossil fuel ISA. But the two parties are not the same, at least not anymore. Democrats have a record of attempting climate action, however limited. This is evident, for example, in Joe Biden's seesaw approach to climate change and the coexistence of Joe Manchin along with the Green New Deal in the same political party. Of course, democratic initiatives are hardly radical. Since the Kyoto Protocol, capitalist climate governance has been the norm. Capitalist climate governance is not denial, but strategies that postpone meaningful action while creating new opportunities for at least certain fractions of capital. You would think this is something the GOP could get behind, as it aligns with free markets, new industries, and state subsidies. But no. Over the last 15 years, the entire Republican Party has systematically obstructed climate action. Here are some of the key forms of GOP obstruction. Blocking legislation, introducing regressive legislation, actively supporting fossil fuel production, blocking appointees supportive of climate mitigation, judicial decisions that block climate action, and suing the state at all levels when it supports climate action. Now before I proceed, let me briefly mention how I began collecting this information. I was initially interested in attacks on critical race theory starting in 2021. I began collecting a list of these attacks. But then I began seeing how they were sometimes paired with climate issues. This led me to develop two lists, CRT and climate. But the climate stuff just got so wild that I had to dig deeper. For example, North Carolina passed a law prohibiting public EV stations uh, unless there were public gas stations. They actually allocated money to destroy the charging stations that did not comply. This led me to really focus on the GOP's climate agenda. When did this start? What are the various forms of climate obstruction? Who are the key actors? How has it changed over time? And how is this connected to race? I've been building a database with the help of several research assistants, and we're probably about 85% done. But the results are so staggering that I don't believe the missing data will significantly alter the conclusion that the GOP has engaged in awe-inspiring levels of obstruction. Again, you may think this is just politicians doing what their donors want. And there is much truth to this. I don't want to pretend otherwise. Here we can see that um, uh, all of the orange is where our GOP politicians receiving fossil fuel uh, funds with Kevin McCarthy leading the pack. And we see two Texas Democrats also receiving uh, significant fossil fuel funding. Nonetheless, I don't believe this tells the whole story. There's four shortcomings in particular with this narrative. First, the GOP has not always aligned with the fossil fuel industry in the way that it does today. Second, the GOP's climate obstruction does not reflect the, vote, the desires of its voters. Third, this overlooks the role of race and assumes a non-racial state. And lastly, this ignores the larger cultural meanings embedded in climate change. Let me go through each of these briefly in turn. The GOP has not always aligned with the fossil fuel industry to the extent that it does now. Capital is nothing if not practical. It knows the future and is planning for energy alternatives and maintaining fossil fuel production. From a capitalist perspective, this makes perfect sense. For example, in 2021, the American Petroleum Institute identified actions to combat climate change, including putting a price on carbon. 
Shell and BP are getting into renewables. ExxonMobil is drilling its first lithium well in Arkansas. Now, I don't want to greenwash the fossil fuel industry, but it contrasts with the GOP, who literally opposes everything. Moreover, it's important to understand that the GOP has not always been so resistant. The Bush administration, working with the fossil fuel industry's global climate coalition, left the Kyoto Protocol and introduced the Clear Skies Initiative which was a much weaker plan based on voluntary cutbacks and tax credits. Here, we see the GOP bowing to industry, but it realizes the need for some kind of action. Today, this would be simply unthinkable. The GOP's climate obstruction does not reflect the desires of its base, especially its younger voters. Research indicates that large majorities of Americans believe climate change is real. 94% of Democrats and 67% of Republicans believe in climate change happening. And I want to bring your attention to the red. Those are Republican voters who uh, responded to this survey. Over 60% of Republicans actually believe the government should take some action when it comes to climate. Indeed, 75% support tax breaks to encourage renewables. And I want you to remember this, because this is something that I'm going to be coming back to. Now, there certainly is plenty of disagreement on many actions between Republican and Democrats. I don't want to pretend otherwise. But I do argue that the GOP's actions do not reflect its base. Its base is not clamoring for climate obstruction. And if you recall when, like, Nikki Haley, when there still were GOP uh, nominees, Young people asking those politicians, those potential poten uh, presidential candidates, what's your plan around climate, right? Of which they gave a whole array of answers. <laughs> the third reason we need to look beyond regulatory capture is that it assumes a non-racial state. If the fossil fuel uh, ISA exists at the intersection of the state and civil society, and if race is a material discursive formation embedded in US history, territory and culture, it presumably plays a role in many topics seemingly unrelated to race. Heather McGee in The Sum of Us shows how racism costs all Americans and is responsible for such things as the absence of universal health care. She argues that because whites worried black people would disproportionately benefit from universal health care, they opposed it altogether. And I love this phrase of hers, why can't we have nice things, right? In which she would argue that racism is one of the core reasons why we don't have nice things. The final problem stemming from regulatory capture framework is that it overlooks the many meanings embedded in fossil fuels and climate change. Naomi Klein has argued that the right understands the profound challenges that climate change poses to its worldview and values. She argues that climate change is, in fact, an indictment of capitalism. It poses a crisis, not just to our physical world, but to the right's ideology. Thus, the GOP's commitment to obstruction is an attempt to deny an existential threat. The ISA framework helps us understand how various meanings become attached to fossil fuels so that light bulbs become equated with personal freedom. Recall that it is a system of institutions, organizations, and practices which uphold dominant ideologies. Three features of the fossil fuel ISA are especially relevant to my analysis. First, as previously mentioned, ISAs operate at the interface of civil society and the state. Thus, there's a robust arena which allows for all kinds of connections. Second, the far right and the fossil fuel ISA are intimately connected. We can see this, for example, in the many think tanks which have actively manufactured denial and are right now working to produce an entire agenda for the second Trump administration. And lastly, white nationalism is a central feature of the US right. I want to really hone in here on the role of white nationalism. Drawing on both Benedict Anderson and Sunera Thubani, 
I define the white nation as an imagined sovereign political community in which white people and whiteness are centered. Because whiteness is a hierarchical, genocidal, and exclusionary category, its legitimacy requires the continual erasure of its violence. This entails the cultivation and maintenance of white innocence. The problem for the white nation is that it is facing multiple crises. Not only are the demographics of the US changing, what is often called the great replacement, but the very innocence of the white nation is being called into question, as evident in Black Lives Matter and calls for racial and colonial reckoning. Thus, the right is contending with two existential crises. And I wish to focus here in this overlapping section in the Venn diagram. This is where white nationalism becomes linked to climate obstruction. White nationalism has been key to the GOP's success for decades. It realized in 1970 with the Southern strategy that actively cultivating white grievance and resentment is a winning strategy. This has led the GOP to rely increasingly on white nationalism. While this is used intentionally, for example, to get votes, its energy has become so dynamic and ferocious that it has created a larger political climate that leads to unanticipated connections and consequences. Thus, in the case of climate obstruction, we see both court carefully orchestrated acts of obstruction as well as actions inspired by the larger culture of white nationalism. As such, white nationalism produces value for the right through votes, political, political support, and political energy, and for the larger fossil fuel industry. I now want to share three specific moments of GOP climate obstruction, which will illustrate different logics as well as its overall trajectory. I begin with the Tea Party, which emerged in 2009. For those of you who remember this, it arose in response to the corporate bailout of the 2008 economic collapse. Many see it as primarily an economic and political project, but it was also deeply wedded to white nationalism. Specifically, it was energized by the election of Barack Obama and quickly gave rise to the birther movement which insisted that Obama was not actually born in the US and therefore not a legitimate president. It also became virulently anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim. The Tea Party embodied what Hosang and Lowndes called the producer parasite paradigm in which Latino immigrants were seen as overly entitled and undeserving and Muslims were suspected of terrorism and trying to take over the US. The Tea Party unleashed a torrent of white rage that swept 138 new Republicans into office. By one estimate, the Tea Party movement generated anywhere from 2.7 to 5.5 million additional votes for the GOP in 2010. The Tea Party is enormously important in understanding the contemporary right. It opened the floodgates to a whole new political landscape. The Tea Party engaged in climate obstruction in at least three ways. First, it contributed to an increase in denial. Second, it opened the door to climate obstruction. And third, it popularized anti-statism. I'm just gonna discuss the first two. Until 2009, there had been a slow and steady uptick in the belief that climate change was real and human caused. But in 2009, we begin to see a reversal. And this is the sli same slide that I showed earlier. This was due to something called Climate Gate, which some of you may recall. Climate Gate was a 2009 leak from East Anglia University's Climate Research Unit that the right used as supposed proof that climate change was a hoax and climate scientists were frauds. Because of the right wing media ecosystem, Tea Party members were disproportionately impacted and believed it. Climate gave fit with a larger anti-elitist, anti-state narrative, what Arlie Hochschild calls the deep story, and led to actual declines in climate change belief. And here I'm indebted to the work of Anthony Leisterwitz, who um, began uncovering some of this work and generously shared it with me. It also energized GOP politicians who went on the attack. 
Most notable was Senator Jim Inhofe from Oklahoma, who published Census Ex Consensus Exposed, the CRU controversy, in which he argued against the existence of a scientific consensus. But more ominous were state challenges to the EPA. Several states sued the EPA to stop it regulating greenhouse gases and a group of GOP attorney generals challenged the EPA's endangerment finding, which refers to its determination that greenhouse gas endangered people and therefore should be regulated. Well, the substance of this demand is certainly important. Equally significant was its strategy, Republican attorney generals acting in concert. This is a strategy that will grow over time. So how is this connected to white nationalism? Both the emergence of and decline of the Tea Party were greatly energized by it. Research indicates that not only were Tea Party members more likely to see people of color as parasites, but they also mourned the loss of their country, again drawing from Arlie Hochschild's strangers in their own land. But the decline of the Tea Party is also deeply wedded to white nationalism. Its energy and rage led to the election directly of Donald Trump. The Tea Party essentially morphed into MAGA beginning in 2015. This is a very important moment in terms of the U.S. racial formation. Next we move to the Trump era. During the Trump era, we see a major increase in climate obstruction. It can be broken into three categories. A few spectacular transgressive acts, efforts to undermine scientific research regarding climate, and reversing the progress made under Obama. I'll just discuss the first two. Although Trump didn't talk much about climate during his campaign, he offered two powerful signals that revealed his position, both of which were very transgressive and spectacular, leaving the Paris Climate Accord and the war on coal. Both events were filled with meaning. The war on coal was how he characterized the Obama administration's climate action. Trump declared the war over in March 2017 when he passed an executive order revoking the rules on carbon emissions. But the war on coal was not just about carbon emissions. As suggested earlier, it was also very much an anti-elitist approach. The war on coal must be seen as a discursive strategy that flipped what was becoming normative thinking regarding carbon emissions, i.e., we need to limit them. Second. It was also a way to connect with coal miners, 93% of whom are white and 93% of whom are male. As such, they represent a key demographic, rural, white, male, working class voters. But Trump used coal to portray himself as a friend of workers. He successfully linked together several key political strands, struggling whites, anti-elitism, and the fossil fuel industry. But the most impactful form of climate obstruction was the systematic overturning of Obama-era climate actions. Trump overturned 112 Obama-era environmental regulations. The first two categories we see here, air pollution emissions and drilling and extraction, account for almost half of all the rollbacks. The Rhodium Group estimated that the rollbacks added 1.8 gigatons of CO2 equivalent into the atmosphere. Altogether, the rollbacks were vast and diverse. They ranged from changing the social cost of carbon from $43 per ton to $5 per ton to the departure of over 1,200 scientists and environmental policy experts. But the most significant act was repealing Obama's clean power plan. This was the U.S. first effort to shift our power infrastructure away from fossil fuels. It was repealed and replaced with the far, far weaker Affordable Clean Energy Plan. So instead of establishing national and state level emission goals and strategies, individual coal plants are supposed to be more efficient and the states ensuring that they meet their efficiency goals. This was a total gift to the coal industry. So again, what's a connection to white nationalism? First, Oh, I missed a sorry. Sorry, um, my bad. Okay. <laughs> first, race and immigration were the bedrocks of Trump's first campaign and presidency. 
Recall how he announced his candidacy in June 2015 by declaring Mexicans as rapists and criminals. Here, he was hailing the white nation, and we saw the Tea Party morph into MAGA. Second, Trump's racist agenda served to distract from environmental deregulation. And this is something that I have worked with some students on, and we have uh, talked about this elsewhere here, including at the U of O, comparing his environmental and racist agendas in his first year. One of the things that we found was that Trump's racist agenda in his first year was very loud, meaning that's what he was talking about the whole time, uh, with most of the attention going to the focus on the Muslim ban and building the border wall. In contrast, his environmental agenda was stealth, quiet, and devastating. In short, we see Trump doing the bidding of the fossil fuel industry, but it is myopic to disregard the role of racism in how he got into office, the distraction racism provided, the multiple meanings of fossil fuels, and how he implemented his agenda. The final era I discuss is the war on wokeness. Now, despite the, oh boy, there I am, not, not paying attention to my slides, sorry, okay. Despite uh, the climate crisis worsening around the globe and clear majorities in the U.S. wanting climate action, the GOP has attacked climate action in an innovative fashion by directly linking it to the war on wokeness. Now, after the Trump presidency, uh, two important things happen. First, Biden gets elected, and we do see some actual progress on climate. Specifically, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed in 2022. This was the U.S. most significant climate legislation to date. The second thing that we see happen, however, is we begin to see the fight for the soul of the Republican Party. Many in the GOP, it may be hard to imagine this now, I realize, but many did believe that Trump was a liability, given his impeachment and the role in the January since insurrection. According, many Republicans wanted to see a change in leadership. However, Trump still controlled the MAGA base. Where am I? I don't know. Okay, so until January of this year, when DeSantis finally dropped out, multiple politicians are actively courting MAGA, and we may have been doing this for the past several years in the hopes that they, in fact, can get the MAGA support and get into office. If one of them could have attracted that support and been successful, the GOP could have theoretically nominated somebody besides Trump. Of course, nobody succeeded in doing this. But that does not change the fact that this political battle produced ever more levels of climate obstruction as they were all competing with each other. Wokeness, or being awake, is the right's caricature of left politics. Specifically, it ridicules such things as identity politics, pronouns, and anti-racism in order to undermine them. It began as a response to the anti-racism to the anti-racist movement that developed after the murder of George Floyd in March 2020. As you may recall, there was massive public support for Black Lives Matter across the country and even globally. Kimberly Crenshaw argues that the war on wokeness is the backlash to the insistence that black lives actually matter, as well as calls for a racial and colonial reckoning. Throughout US history, all forms of racial progress have been followed by a white backlash dating back to Reconstruction. The current backlash began with critiques of police as racist. The right responded by defending police, or what became Blue Lives Matter. They especially rejected claims that police were racist. This is important because white innocence was being directly attacked by anti-racist activists. So the white nation mobilized. This leads directly to attacks on critical race theory and DEI. As of June 2023, there were only six states where anti-CRT legislation had not been introduced. In terms of anti-DEI legislation, it has been introduced in more than half of all states. I think this is as of March, this, this uh, map here. And we all saw how anti-DEI sentiment was instrumental in removing two university presidents this past winter. 
These early attacks against CRT really quickly leapt into attacks on gender studies, if you may recall, in Florida. This then led to direct legislative attacks on queer and transgendered bodies, including Florida's famous Don't Say Gender Law, which is an effort to erase anybody who is not uh, cis heteronormative. So we have all this ferocious energy directed against anti-racism, gender equality, and the right to be queer and trans. In this moment, we see three ways that climate becomes linked to wokeness. First, the GOP resists linking climate to, any, to structural change. Second, it insists the real existential threat is wokeness. And lastly, the GOP's climate obstruction begins to borrow strategies from the war on wokeness. So the first one here, the right opposes linking climate to demands for structural change. Calls for such change are dismissed as part of the loony left and socialist plots. For example, GOP efforts have focused on banning investment firms from considering the social and environmental consequences of their actions, what is known as ESG, environmental social governance. 27 red states so far have introduced 145 bills to kill ESG. Texas led the way by banning BlackRock because it, quote, discriminated against fossil fuels. Likewise, the GOP has blocked financial leaders and firms from considering the cost of climate change and risk assessments, as seen in the withdrawal of Sarah Bloom Raskin as a candidate to lead the Federal Reserve. Eventually, weakened rules did pass earlier this month in, uh, in March, and no sooner did they do, within days later, 10 GOP states sued to block the new disclosure rules from going into effect. Next. The GOP insists that the real existential threat is wokeness. Children, in particular, are threatened and must be protected. On the one hand, this must be seen as a form of distraction. Just like climate, most voters do not support the war on wokeness, only segments of the MAGA base. But if indeed the GOP is contending with twin existential threats, the obsession with wokeness is also a form of denial. First, it is denying the reality of climate change, including the need for structural transformation. The GOP realizes that a woke agenda can, or orientation can, in fact, lead people to believe that climate change is real and does require fundamental change. Thus, it must be stopped. And second, the GOP's obsession with wokeness is a clear denial of US white supremacy. Republicans do not believe that white supremacy is a core feature of the U.S. and will stop at nothing from, getting other, from stopping others from believing it as well. And finally, GOP climate obstruction borrows strategy from the war on wokeness, both through book banning and curriculum changes. Book banning has become central to the war on wokeness. In just a six-month period in 2022, almost 150 books were banned. 30% of them were by people of color, and 25% were by LGP, LGBTQ plus authors. Several states, including Texas and Oklahoma, are trying to ban books that don't tell both sides of climate. And Florida has approved the use of educational videos on climate from PragerU which is funded by right-wing radio host Dennis Prager. None of this, of course, can be understood outside of a deeply polarized country where GOP politicians compete to see who can do the most outrageous things in the war on wokeness to attract MAGA support. As Florida Governor Ron DeSantis proclaims, Florida is where wokeness goes to die. But not all acts of climate obstruction are performative. In 2022, zero Republicans voted for Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. Moreover, since Republicans regained control of the House in 2023, they've tried to repeal it and replace it with the Limit, Save, Grow Act. Central to this bill is a section called the Repeal Market Distorting Green Tax Credits which repeals over a dozen tax credits meant to encourage the energy transition. 
Recall that tax credits are favored by large majorities of both parties. And here, I don't know if you can see this in the red, some of the key things that they want to repeal tax credits are include uh, things for solar wind in low-income communities, energy efficient commercial buildings, uh, electric vehicles, and even things like nuclear power. Perhaps the most significant obstruction to date is the lawsuit West Virginia versus EPA, in which the Supreme Court ruled that the EPA does not have the authority to regulate CO2 emissions. Only Congress does. We have yet to see how this will play out, but it will likely gut regulations across the social and environmental landscape. The right has been trying to curb the administrative state for decades and has finally succeeded thanks to the current judiciary, which has three Trump appointees. I would be remiss, however, if I did not mention the Conservative Climate Caucus. This is a group of GOP lawmakers who feel the party must respond to climate change, and they began meeting literally in secret in 2021. Initially, I thought this might be a form of climate action. And to a certain extent it is, as it acknowledges that climate change is real and they have begun organizing around it. However, it can also be seen very much as a case of greenwashing. Its stated goal, goal is to, quote, educate House Republicans on climate policies and legislation, consistent with conservative values. Their solutions include fossil fuels and, quote, fighting against radical progressive climate proposals that would hurt our economy, American workers, and national security, unquote. Needless to say, its members oppose such things as tax credits for electric vehicles. And finally, here we are again with Trump running for president. His campaign does not bode well for climate action. Perhaps not surprisingly, his campaign has doubled down on immigration. But while in the past he downplayed climate obstruction, he now loudly embraces it, proclaiming that if elected, he would begin, quote, mass deportations and drill, drill, drill. There's a lot going on here. First, we see the coupling of white nationalism and climate obstruction. Second, we see a shift in his climate discourse. There's nothing secret about this aggressive agenda. Drill, drill, drill signals to MAGA that he will continue to be a disruptor, to flaunt normative expectations, and to fully support the fossil fuel industry, as it is the antithesis of wokeness. So to conclude, I am certainly not arguing that white nationalism has caused the U.S.'s long history of climate obstruction, denial, and disinformation. But if we trace the history of how we got to where we are, I believe that white nationalism is an important factor. It has been one thread woven through a rich and complex tapestry. White nationalism has unleashed tremendous energy and power that the GOP covets. Not only will politicians do whatever they can to gain the allegiance of MAGA, but its surplus nature enables many unanticipated possibilities. Moreover, we can see how it has varied over time. In the Tea Party era, white nationalism helped fuel the movement, but climate and racism were still seen as two separate spheres. During the Trump era, white nationalism both fueled MAGA and served as a distraction to massive environmental deregulation. And finally, in the war on wokeness, we see a direct convergence of white nationalism and climate. Climate is linked to efforts to protect white innocence while also serving as a distraction and form of denial. Indeed, just this past month, we began to see parallels between how Trump talks about immigrants and EVs. Clearly, climate has taken on far greater meanings in a polarized political landscape. It has become attached to a whole series of political identities, constituencies, and movements especially an energized white nationalist base. Thank you. So um, Laura's gonna take some questions. If you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone so that the people that are live streaming can hear your question. Anybody have any? Start here. 
Hi, um, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more what you mean about surplus white nationalism. I didn't quite connect those two. I, so that was in the original abstract, then I took it out because I'm struggling with it. <laughs> so initially I was thinking that this is a case of surplus white nationalism because there's many times or early on when the GOP deliberately, okay, we're going to really cultivate the white grievance because we want votes for this. But I think we've reached this point where it is so uh, out of the box, shall we say, that it cannot be controlled and harnessed in uh, easily anymore these days. Um, now, some might say, well, isn't that the nature anyway of net nationalism? <laughs> so that's why I'm kind of being ambiguous about it right now. I haven't figured that out. One time when I talked about surplus white nationalism, one of my former colleagues, Manuel Pastores, asked me, well, Lara, what would be the appropriate amount of white nationalism? <laughs> uh, other questions for Lara? Thank you so much uh, for this incredibly important work. And I, I'm actually incredibly excited about the database, because I feel like one of the things that needs to happen is the exposure of the way that oh. white nationalism is deeply connected to climate extractionism, and your work is doing that. And it's incredibly important. Um, I have a question about the kind of unholy trinity of racism, uh, climate obstructionism, and, and the sort of movement against women's sovereignty of, over their own bodies. And I wonder yeah. if, if you might talk a little bit about, because you did talk about the sort of uh, gender and how it figures in the anti-wokeness crusade, but I'm also curious about the, the turnover of Roe and, and the kind of resurgence of a potent anti-abortion um, sort of social movement, you know, and I, I'm right. wondering how you figure that into things. Right. I don't, no. <laughs> um, I have been, I, I have been, I'm talking off the top of my head here. So I've been thinking a lot and reading a lot about authoritarianism, right, and um, obviously Trump being a very, you know, um, prototypical case of that, and the importance of the patriarch to authoritarianism, and not only the need for um, the patriarch to be in control, but also for there also to be very clear gender roles and the binary, and, you know, again, things have run amok, right, in, in this regard as far as the right is concerned. And so what we, one of the things that we do see in terms of this true support for Trump is somebody who can reassert both masculinity, the proper role of patriarchy, and I haven't really, I, I don't, I have not spent enough time actually connecting the dots about, because on the one hand, anti-abortion is a long-standing movement. And I don't want to pretend it's recent, and it has, it's not new, <laughs> right, in, in what's happening. Um, this has been going for a very long time. But what we need to be tracking then is how the connection between anti-abortion and then populism and authoritarianism at this particular moment. Of course, and there's been a lot of work coming out about white Christian nationalism and what is happening um, in, in that regard and why they turn so much to Trump. You know, Trump is like their tough guy who'll take on their fights for them in ways that, you know, they potentially are not comfortable doing. And, you know, he's delivered in ways that are really critical to them. So I think that's a, an area that I really need to do a lot more work on. Thanks. Other questions? Thank you, Laura. That was terrific. Um, I, w I wondered if I could ask you if you see, there was one other angle to this that, that I sort of perceive, and I'm wondering if you do as well, which is the connection between white nationalism, um, energy policy, and democracy, and minority rule. Um, if you've had the misfortune, as I have, of at times brushing up against the, the militant right, there's an increasingly um, open uh, conversation about, <clears throat> about minority rule, about the, why democracy is actually not the correct form of government and that it's justified um, that a minority, a demographic minority should rule. And if you look at the, um, the data that you presented about um, uh, American opinions on climate change, you see that even the Republicans, even the Republican Party, a majority supports climate change policy, believes it's real, and so on. And so the only way to achieve a um, anti-climate policy would be to have a, a minority form of government. I'm just wondering if, and that the white nationalism gives us a um, culturally constructed justification for that uh, minority form of government. Oh, that's a brilliant putting together of it, I think you doing there, Peter. 
I, um, um, I mean, I've been paying attention to discussions about minority rule, and it's not just demographic, but it's also kind of ideological, right? We need to take it over because we know what's best. But I have not made the, I guess in an earlier time, I had thought about the ways in which, um, um, you know, early on, the Republic, the GOP had to figure out, okay, our agenda's not popular, so how are we gonna sell it, right? And they, they had to really work around that. that, that, that kind of, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was getting too intimate. Um, so it, um, this was a wonderful question that was asked about the connection with minority rule, and I have not thought that out. I think we see various pieces throughout time that all lead to that, and I think, I mean, they're very clear about minority rule in terms of, of both race, but also ideological. And so this could be a really wonderful example. I mean, I know there's, I've talked to some political scientists and say, well, just because people want something doesn't, you can't assume it's gonna be reflected in their priorities. And I don't know enough of the political science literature, you know, to respond to that. But I do know what MAGA wants, and MAGA's getting a lot of what they want, <laughs> right? And they're, they're quite comfortable. And I think it's, it's also not just the thing about the racial dominance, but it's also about the religious one too. Right, going back to Christian values, because this country was created as a Christian nation, therefore it is appropriate and fine for us to go back to that in terms of minority rules. Thank you, I'll be thinking about that for a long time. Other, other questions? Yeah, thank you so much um, for this excellent talk. I was wondering if you could speak, um, I know the talk is focused on the GOP, but I was really taken by the idea that, uh, the anti-wokeness campaign which connects the sort of white supremacy with climate denial and obstruction <clears throat> is about an existential threat. And I was interested because I think like a lot of times the Democratic Party will use the terms of existential threat when we're talking mm. about climate change, right? Yeah. So like we have to respond, I'm sorry, I'm like, <clears throat> my allergies. Um, we have to respond to climate change because it's an existential threat. But then you also have the same sort of framework being used as a way to obstruct like um, appropriate measures to address climate change, as well as like appropriate measures to address white supremacy and stuff like that. So I'm I'm just curious. Like, it, I find it interesting when the same kind of like rhetorical or discursive move shows up, and I was just wondering if you've like thought about that at all. Well, it would make sense to me, because I, I do think that Democrats really do see, and we, again, we have lots of like survey data on this, they do see climate change as an existential threat. And I think I, it was go back to the fact that it's such as a, po a polarized political culture that we're living in, and if you are so polarized, and if you cannot find any common ground, well then, they are existential threats. That, when otherwise they may not necessarily be seen as that way because, oh, we can work together towards something, you know, even if we're a very fractious bunch, you know, but that's not what's, what's happening at, at all, you know. So, yeah, I think it partly is, that's a very good observation. I know Lamia had a question. <laughs> Last but not the least. Um, I have to take it up. Um, thank you very much for a thought-provoking talk. You've given us much to think about. I wanted to ask you about the paradoxical relationship between anti-statism and uh, white nationalism, right? Because you have a large swath of people in this country who do not want to have anything to do with the government. They don't want the government. At the same time, these very people are happily taking their social security benefits, Medicare, Medicaid benefits, that is coming from the government. Similarly, these people are putting all this anti-legislation, but at the same time, they expect the local governments to discipline uh, the communities by making sure these things are being implemented, right? Um, so if you could speak a little bit about this strange or paradoxical relationship that the state should not be there. The state should not tell us about how to manage climate. And it's mostly within this right-wing uh, group that you see it. At the same time, they are turning to the state for many of their grievances to be ad addressed. Right. So I think that's a real d definite contradiction that we do, do see. Um, it, again, there's been a 
plenty of interesting research on this, particularly if you look like at rural communities, which are very heavy Trump, uh, Trump supporters. In fact, but they show there's been lots of different kinds of analyses and maps showing that um, red areas are basically subsidized by blue areas through transfer payments and all kinds of things like that. And you know, during the first Trump administrate ad admin, there was you know with like Steve Bannon, it's like about shrinking the administrative state. He's really on a war path about that, as well as some of his other funders and backers. And now I really you know. I think there's much more talk about, no, we want the state for our own ends, uh, at least coming from some of the Trump circle and some of their policies. So it is, it, they are concerned about cre uh, creating a more business-friendly um, environment through different kinds of measures, and there is some deregulation happening, but I don't think that we're, they're going to be a, a huge uh, shrinking of the administrate. It's more a reharnessing of it for particular purposes, which doesn't address your question about the contradiction, because there is so much, you know, through the Tea Party movement, and again, there's a longer history, but we see really becoming um, blossoming in the Tea Party movement, the full-on anti-statism as of a huge, uh, you know, the belief that the state is doing, it's, it's controlled by elites, it's supporting people of color, it has an agenda that is like, you know, supporting uh, queer people and, all kinds of things that we don't agree with. So why would we support the state? So I, I don't understand that at all, those, those contradictions. But I do really think that it, the Trump administration will not just be a decline of the, administ of the shrinking of it. It'll be more complicated. Other questions? Ask Laura the pressure. Gosh, hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk, Laura. I, I guess I would ask we've made these connections, we're in this situation. In looking at the strategies people have used, what would you say now for us, or as we're working with our students who are feeling a little overwhelmed and a little, um, yeah, overwhelmed, terrified, thank you. I'm like, what's the word like to articulate how what I'm hearing from my students and how I feel myself seeing yeah. this? Yeah. What, what do we do now? I have no message of hope. <laughs> I feel it's really important that we all start taking very seriously the right, and we need to start studying it. If you're white, you need to be out there working in white communities and trying to challenge them, and there's been lots of really interesting programs that have happened, including some here in Oregon, to promote that. Um, they are so organized, it's shocking. They have tons of money. They're unified and they are on the war path and will have huge consequences for all of us in terms of what happens. So yeah, I don't, I, I, I actually had to stop doing my conventional EJ stuff because I just couldn't do it anymore. It just felt like false. This is like, this is not where things are happening. You know, I think like in ethnic studies, we really need to pay a lot more attention to the right, um, given that we're often targets and scapegoats of it. But, you know, especially, I think, you know, there's been so much more attention focusing on questions about, you know, celebrating activism and, and, and things like that, which is certainly important, but there needs to be a balance, you know. And I know my other, like, department, discipline like geography, you know, we have like all kinds of wild plans and ideas about what we need to do in terms of degrowth and, you know, all kinds of things like that. Again, not untrue, but like, where are we at right now? And we all need a very serious reality check about that, and we need to be engaged at that level. So, <laughs> on that hopeful note, thank, thank Laura Polito. <laughs>